This morning, as we focus on the work of the Nova Scotia Gambia Association in Gambia, we are reminded that one of the principal functions of Jesus during his ministry was that of healing. Jesus demonstrated God's healing power through his life and that God's intention for life was one of healing. The NSGA continues that ministry today in a whole variety of wonderful ways. And we are called to support that ministry too. So as we listen to some of the examples of healing from Jesus' ministry, may we ponder how all of us are called to continue his ministry of healing. I'm reading from the Gospel of Matthew chapter 9, verses 18 to 30. As Jesus was speaking, a synagogue official came up, knelt down, and said, My daughter has just died, but if you come and lay hands on her, she will live. So Jesus got up and went with the official, and so did the disciples. As they were going along, a woman who had suffered from hemorrhages for 12 years came up behind him and touched the hem of his cloak. She was saying to herself, if only I could touch his cloak, I will be healed. Jesus turned around and saw her. Courage, daughter, he said, your faith has healed you. That very moment, the woman was healed. When Jesus arrived at the house of the synagogue official, a noisy crowd had gathered, and the flute players who served as mourners had already arrived. When he saw them, he said, get out. The child is not dead, only asleep. They laughed at him. After the crowd had been put out, he entered and took the girl by the hand, and she got up, and the news spread throughout the countryside. As Jesus moved on from Capernaum, two blind people followed and cried out, Hair to the house of David, have pity on us. When Jesus reached his lodgings, they caught up with him. And Jesus said to them, Do you believe that I can do this? They said, Yes, Rabbi. And then he touched their eyes and said, Because of your faith, it will be done to you. And their sight returned. May the Spirit bless us with understanding and insight of his word. I would now like to invite up Caitlin Regan Catro. She is the Chair of the NSGA Board of Directors, and she will be introducing our special speaker today. Good morning, everyone. Uh, I went to the Gambia in 2006 with the NSGA and uh, the BUC. And uh, a few years later, I found myself on the board of directors. And in 2015, uh, we had today's special guest here in Nova Scotia. And he actually gave a presentation here at this church as well. Uh, that following year, I became chair. And over the, my first year as chair, I communicated with Abdu uh, at least on a weekly basis, if not more. And he impressed me. One thing I learned over that year was that he is what I call a practical academic. And Abdu desired to further his studies. He originally graduated from the University of the Gambia with a Bachelor of Arts in Honors in Development Studies. And he started with the NSGA at an entry level field staff position and worked his way up to now the national program manager of the entire organization. But Abdu wanted more. And he wanted to study here in Nova Scotia. And we thought this was an excellent idea, but the practicalities of it seemed a little bit daunting. I mean, it's very expensive to go to university here, and how would we manage without him in the Gambia? And all of our fears were assuaged when, uh, last year, Abdu won a full-ride scholarship from the African Leaders of Tomorrow to study at Dalhousie to do a master's in public administration. Abdu is now here with us, and he is here today to impart his wisdom, because Abdu truly has a mind for development, both the practicalities of it and the theory of it. And I'm very proud to introduce Abdu, who has left his family behind for two years to come study with us. So Maimuna, Mohammed, Fatima, and Amina are all back in the Gambia while Abdu is here, still working with us. And it is my great pleasure and distinct honor to introduce to you our National Program Manager, Abdu Kante.
mic is on? Yeah. Good. Um, thank you very much, Kathleen, for that wonderful uh, introduction. I'm glad to meet all of you once again, and I was here in 2015. Uh, the same church, the same podium, probably mostly the same people. <laughs> um, I would like to briefly introduce the work of Nova Scotia Gambia Association, but I will do this <clears throat> in a different approach. Probably I will leave it to you to better understand the work of <clears throat> this, no, this organization in the Gambia from the stories I would give you. It is not just an imaginary world, but it's practical and real. Imagine a pregnant mother who was bitten by an infected mosquito. What the with the uh, parasite that causes malaria. This poor woman living in a remote village in rural Gambia, she became infected with malaria. She is pregnant. She lives in a village very far from the next health facility. She has no idea as to what is happening to her. She has not been visiting the clinic on a regular basis. She went up to six or seven years. She went up to six or seven months into her pregnancy without paying a visit to the clinic. Can you imagine that? Can you imagine that she became sick? She became anemic, severe anemia, and then she was rushed to the hospital. Can you imagine that the only means of transportation would be a horse cart or a donkey cart? Can you imagine how many hours it will take for the horse cart or the donkey cart to reach to the nearest health facility. Can you imagine that some would deliver on the way without the help of a trained midwife to help her deliver? Can you imagine a woman delivering in the forest? Can you imagine if that woman is anemic? Imagine if she has severe malaria. What could be done? Some might lose their lives. For some, the baby is born not alive. Even if the baby is born alive, there are complications. Can you imagine that even if this woman was able to make it to the clinic, she arrived at the clinic very, 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 very tired. In fact, almost dead. These are real life examples happening in my country. Can you imagine a team of young people using drama, acting out short, precise, informative, educative, and entertaining health drama using messages to inform these people in these communities, in the underserved rural communities, about malaria. 
What is that disease? What causes it? How is it transmitted from one person to another? And how do you prevent yourself from having malaria through a mosquito bite? Can you imagine? These messages are not only to entertain, but to prepare these vulnerable people to prevent malaria from happening to them, to prevent them from a situation where they will get sick and go through all that trouble of being anemic, sick with malaria, far from the health center, and even losing lives. Can you imagine, after such an interactive drama staged in a village square, villagers would come in numbers, and they are concerned about their health. They'll be throwing questions to our team of young people we call the drama troopers. The drama troops are called a team, a caravan. We call them the health promotion caravan. They move from one village to another, spreading the word, spreading the message about health. They ask questions and they are eager to practice those behaviors that will prevent them from having a mosquito bite. Sleep under a treated bed net correctly and consistently. Sometimes they don't even know where to get the bed net from. In year 2014, there were bed nets packed in health facilities and villagers or community members don't even know where the bed nets are. We played a great role to inform these people that they can go get a bed net from those facilities. Sleeping on the treated bed net correctly, consistently, all year round can prevent malaria. For pregnant mothers, they were keen to learn that for the first three months into their pregnancy, they should visit the nearest health facility to be tested if they have malaria or not. And even if they don't have malaria, they are given three tablets of Fancida to prevent malaria in pregnancy. Can you imagine if that woman who had malaria during pregnancy knew about this information. Can you imagine if she got to the nearest health facility and got this prevention, the intermittent preventive treatment on time? Can you imagine how her life would be saved and the life of the baby, of the fetus in the womb? These are some of the activities, initiatives, and undertakings that Nova Scotia Gambia Association is doing. Giving information, encouraging people to adapt the preventive behaviors, change their behaviors positively to prevent them from having these diseases. In my country, people would wait until they become severely sick before they can seek for medical attention. Sometimes because of poverty, at times because of lack of information, at times lack of access to the facilities and services. Can you imagine a vulnerable young girl who goes to school. Because she grew up in a culture where parents don't talk to their kids about sex and sexuality because they think it's a taboo. It's a taboo. Don't talk about it. Can you imagine breaking that culture of silence? 
Imagine the young girl's mother gave her an advice. When she saw her first menses, just introduced into puberty, she rushed to the mom and the mom said, I have a message for you. Welcome to the kingdom of women. From today, never allow a man to touch your breast. And that was it. Can you imagine that that information went deep into her mind and she tries to ensure that no man touches her breast? Can you imagine that girl being pressured by peers into having an affair. Everyone does it. The peer pressure in school. Can you imagine this girl? Vulnerable, got less information, less empowered, got into the hands of a sexual predator. And during that encounter, she was very careful with the breast and saying, my mom said, I should not allow any man to touch my breast. But anything can be done. You can touch somewhere else. No problems. The girl got pregnant. Can you imagine that the girl got pregnant at the age of 11? Can you imagine this girl going through the hard times of pregnancy? Was she prepared mentally, physiologically? Can you imagine that girl going through the pains of labor? Can you imagine that girl losing her life? Can you connect that to the work of Nova Scotia Gambia Association where we intervene, we work in schools, work with young people, empower them with the messages. Tell them everything. Not the haphazard information that the woman gave to her child, to her baby, to, to her girl child. We empower them with the information. We tell them everything. We are very open to them. We prepare them. We empower them with the messages. Can you imagine and compare a girl child who enrolled into the peer health education club of the school with the girl child who has not? There is difference. These are very bold young people who take charge of their lives. Sexual predators, sugar daddies, those who abuse, spare these girls. They said they are very powerful. They know what they're doing. Can you imagine such an impact you have made in the lives of these vulnerable girls in our communities? This is the kind of work we do we empower young people with life skills, how to communicate, how to think critically and make a good decision, how to manage a healthy relationship, how to control your emotions for good. All of these are life skills we empower in young people. Connect that to how we have contributed to reducing the incidence of teenage pregnancy or child pregnancy, dropping out of school because of, child pregn because of pregnancy. Can you imagine how we have contributed to building an empowered society of young people 
who take charge of their lives. Finally, imagine in a community where people think that the only way to develop our community is to have people from outside to come and give us donations. We grab the donations, do whatever we can, and that's it. Can you imagine going to a community like that, bringing the community members together, engage them using participatory approaches? Can you imagine using techniques and approaches where the villagers would see the sketch of their community on the ground for the first time, and they would be astonished. They would be surprised to say, oh, this is amazing for the first time. Can you imagine using a flat ground, ashes, powder, using a stick to draw the community, to draw the features of the community, the resources in the community, of course, that will even highlight where the church is located in the community, where the mosque is located in the community, where the women's horticultural garden is located, where the skill center is located, where the school is located, the elementary school is located, where the car park, where the main highways are. And then what they will learn from this is they will have a reflection session. If this is our community, what are the resources available within? What can we do with these resources? Let's make sense out of this. What do we need? How can we take charge of this initiative? What can the community do on its own? What kind of help do we need from outside? With or without help from outside, how can we make our community better? Imagine the Nova Scotia Gander Association using an approach called community mobilization. We use an approach like this. Going to a community having the community to come together, think about the development needs of the community, assess those needs together as a team, use participatory approaches to sketch the community. We call it community resource mapping. Build on that, reflect on it together, draw a community action plan. Can you imagine, we have done this in a couple of communities before I traveled to Canada. And we did this after three months, I went back to assess progress in these communities and I was amazed. Can you imagine, a community that identified a clinic, a trekking clinic, because that community was 11 miles away from the next health facility, and they said that women sometimes even deliver in the forest. And they identified having a trekking site, a community, a small clinic, whereby a midwife from the, next, from the neighboring clinic would come at least once every week or twice or once every two weeks to come and do basic, let's say, primary health care services, weighing, giving rehydration, techniques, drugs, and so on. Can you imagine I went back to this community, and the community without any kind of help from an outside community were able to install a community clinic. I was surprised. And I said, this is an example of the community being empowered and taking charge of the development of their community. 
Can you imagine the government came to that community and realized that the community has gone further to start that small clinic at taking site, and they requested from the nearest health facility for a, for a nurse to come. Right now, as I'm talking to you, the government has approved a grant to transform that small clinic that was through the community's initiative to a more well-structured community, community clinic where other feeder communities would even come to receive services from there. Can you imagine? This was as a result of the work of Nova Scotia Gambia Association. Community engagement, community mobilization, helping communities to grow using participatory approaches. These are some of the activities that Nova Scotia Gambia Association is doing. Let me summarize this in three bullets. We work with young people on sexual and reproductive health programs using life skills. We do this in schools and in communities. In schools, we work with students, boys and girls, and we have peer health education clubs in these schools. And we work in more than 150 schools in the Gambia. We also work with out-of-school youth groups. These are young people who have just finished secondary school or just finished university and are not doing much. We bring them together so they can be very productive in the society. That is one thing. Secondly, we have malaria prevention program where we go to the communities, we talk to people about malaria and how they can prevent malaria. When I saw a statistic that says, for every 30 seconds an African child dies of malaria, I say no. But when I checked in the records of the Gambia's health system, I realized that child mortality, infant mortality, and maternal death in the Gambia was very high. And the leading factor, the leading cause from all the evidence was because of malaria. Was because of malaria. So we have malaria prevention programs in Gambian schools and communities. Finally, we have the community mobilization component, which is more of engaging communities, more of using participatory approaches, more of helping communities to take charge of their development. These are some of the good things that my organization is doing, and I'm proud to be associated with it. And I'm proud that this church and the people coming to this church are also associated with this success. In the Gambia, the Bedford United Church is like a household name to Nova Scotia Gambia Association. Be proud of your contribution to Nova Scotia Gambia Association and the impact you have also created in the lives of the people in the Gambia. On that note, I would like to say a big thank you for the second time in the same church. Thank you. It's very striking for me, Abdu, that uh, the stories you chose to talk about this morning, and we hadn't planned this, this is the work of the Spirit, right, um, coincide so 
so closely with what we were doing in the larger service this morning with baptizing these children because both these couples here this morning were telling me um, during our baptism preparation session, well, what a wonderful experience you've had at the IWK, right? Just think about the IWK maternity services that we have available here, and they are just stellar. They're just out of this world, right? And no woman has to go and have a child without having that kind of superb care. And, and you've just made so poignantly dramatic the, the reality for so many women in the, in the Gambia. Um, so I want to I wanna thank you for that. And we can make an ongoing, we've made a wonderful contribution over the years by sending young people to the Gambia. Many of them have ended up becoming, doing um, programs in um, international development and that sort of thing. That's part of, part of the work of the NSGA has encouraged them. Um, there's an envelope in your bulletin this morning that if you'd like to support the work of the NSGA, please feel free to be generous. It's, uh, this is a wonderful organization that, that we support and, and you get such a crystal clear statement of the kind of work that you're supporting. Now, I want to ask all of you, your financial support supports people on the ground in the Gambia, um, sending young people as well. It supports um, those kinds of services. But can you imagine can you imagine a thousand other young adults with the skill base and the training and the wisdom and the compassion of Abdu Kante? Can you imagine that? And imagine <coughs> what kind of a difference that can make. And, and I think, Abdu, I can say that the NSGA, it doesn't just support the people that it's serving. It's all the young people who are involved in the drama troupe programs and all of that. Those people are developing wonderful skills and going on to become incredible leaders in their country like this fella here today. So I want to say that's what we're also supporting. And let's uh, give this young leader a wonderful hand again because you're just wonderful. <laughs> I think that's it. Thank you so much. <laughs> Thank you, Abdi. Oh, okay. You're wonderful. Thank that was you. great. <laughs>
Please join me now in prayer. Loving God, we are gathered in this holy space today to offer our heartfelt thanks for all the blessings, big and small, that we acknowledge now in this quiet, peaceful time. For the love we feel all around us from family and friends, for homes that provide us safety and comfort, food and water that sustains us, clothes that bring us warmth against the elements, medical care that keeps us healthy and heals us when we are not, a faith community that welcomes every one of us without judgment or want, only for love. We know there are many around the world and even in our own midst who do not have the basic necessities of life. Far too many people who live in fear of violence and upheaval of everything around them. It is from our place of blessing that we all know we are called to help in those in need. It has been taught to us all so beautifully through the life and lessons of Jesus, and it is shown today through the love and dedication of disciples like Abdu and the members of the NSGA. Bless the efforts of your modern day disciples and show us how we can contribute our many gifts and resources and talents to make a difference in the lives of our brothers and sisters all around the world. Closer to home, we pray for comfort and peace for Charlotte Rhodes at the passing of her father, Donald, and for Charlene Anderson at the passing of her husband, Ronald. May they feel our love and be filled with your comfort and strength as they heal from this loss. We hold up all those in our hearts and those listed in our prayer circle who are in need of healing and support. In this time of transition, as we welcome the season of Advent and the glory of Christmas, where we celebrate the gift of your Holy Son, may we all feel the peace of this moment now and carry it out into our lives to be given and shared with others. In your name, amen.
Thank you to everyone who made this service possible today, for these wonderful new musicians, everybody who volunteered their time, and to Abdu for giving us such an inspired message. Go out, bring this spirit, bring this peace into your world and to the lives of others. Amen. Shabbat